What is up? I'm Jonathan Crane. I'm a mediocre cat too out of Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm Ben, head coach at Skyway Cycling and team director at Skyway, presented by Domestique Coffee. And we got a special guest for this one. I'll let you introduce yourself. Welcome. Hi, I'm Madeline. Uh, I'm a former racer uh, on the collegiate and on the, uh, I guess, the USA crit scene or the formerly USA crit scene. Um, it's back. It's USA crit scene. It's, it's back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's, that's really about it. Cool. Welcome. Well, I guess we're going to try to keep this one brief since this is like not a scheduled episode. This is a uh, emergency podcast about the um, NCL announcement that was made today. I guess I'll start with the announcement itself and we'll go from there, huh? Um, I, I guess I'm just going to throw it up on the screen here. Um, but yeah, the NCL National Criterium League, National Cycling League. I should know this. We've been covering cycling it for a while. league. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've probably said Criterium before. Uh, that shows maybe bad branding on their part. Um, a league that actually, I guess the first episode of this podcast was us trying to unravel like what the hell was going on with this league last year. And, um, here we are almost exactly a year later and they have posted this statement. Um, I don't know. Should I read it in full for the audio listener? This will go up as a podcast later. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just go ahead. All right. National cycling league announces it will pause operations for the 2024 season effective immediately. And this came out today. This is Monday, 15th. April 15th. Um, as it looks to restructure and rebuild for the 2025 season, while NCL will not field events or teams in 2024, the executive team and board of directors will focus on coming back stronger in 2025 by resurrecting its business model within the current economic challenges facing the domestic global and global cycling industry. And then this part's in quotes. Uh, pausing for our 2024 plans affects many teams and riders, and we are working with everyone individually to help them through the 2024 through 2024 and to position everyone for success in 2025 says reed mccalvin vp of operations and teams ncl had planned to field three full co-ed teams miami knights denver disruptors and atlanta rise for the 2024 season these teams were going to battle for the 2024 ncl cup as well as challenge the best teams and riders in the u.s with a full domestic race calendar Writers and staff have been notified and will be assisted through their transitions. In 2023, its inaugural season, NCL hosted three successful criterium races in Miami Beach, Denver, and Atlanta. Those events will not take place in 2024. And then again, in quotes, one of the goals of the National Cycling League has been to build on the current domestic racing scene, says Andrea. Ben, you want to take the last name? I know you know how to say it. Pagnanelli. Pag NCL CEO for us to reach this goal in this market we felt that pausing our 2024 plans to adjust our model will allow us to come back even stronger in the future so this went up today and I think both mine and Ben's uh, you know inboxes on every various social media started going insane like hey did you guys see this did you guys see this yeah um, within 30 seconds of posting I had about 50 messages <laughs> and I was in like a work meeting and my phone was just like going off constantly. And I was like, Hey guys, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah. So we actually were at a race with a lot of the NCL riders yesterday and Saturday at, um, Sunny King and then the, the Sumatonga race. And I talked to several people who were racing NCL yesterday about it. And I think it came as a shock even to them. I guess. Yeah. So Madeline reached out with some actual information on like what went down from that perspective. And, uh, you know, a lot of people reached out and said stuff, but you were the person who said uh, you wanted to come on the show. So <laughs> yeah. you get to deliver this information. I guess I, yeah, I had I had some substantial stuff, I guess. Um, let's see. So I basically was uh, informed um, from like a bunch of people, like my phone was blowing up the same way y'all's was. Um, so what eventually the story has developed into is that 
um, Friday, there was an email supposedly sent out to all the writers um, and staff of the NCL, basically saying that there was a Zoom meeting that was going to be called today on Monday. So then Monday came, everybody logged in. Um, I'm told the call lasted anywhere from two to four minutes. Um, very, very brief with no room to ask questions. And they essentially told everybody that they were out of money. Um, there's no there's no more contracts. Everybody's contract is terminated effective immediately um, and basically hung up on everybody in the call. So nobody was able to ask any questions. Um, subsequent emails were also sent out. And I, let's see, one of them I know at least for a writer um, or not, not a writer, but um, one of them said basically that it was just everything's terminated. There's an NDA agreement that you guys have to like abide by still, even though the contracts are still terminated. Um, so nobody is essentially allowed to say anything publicly about it, which I personally think is really weird. Like I've been on a couple of cycling teams and I've never had to sign an NDA. Um, <laughs> yeah, the but, NCL contract, that's one of the things we talked about early on was the contracts were like, they, they had some stuff that was uh beyond normal cycling con like stuff yeah. about your likeness and stuff about social media requirements and not just like don't post some wild stuff on social media like there there were there were some clauses in there that were uh troubling to me that we talked about and we got feedback both ways like other writers and people being like yeah these contracts are insane and then some people being like you guys are just not lawyers so you're like over right this contract. yeah i got i got both of that um people saying basically it was like oh well it's legal speak and it was like look i've signed i've signed what is it two contracts for and i wouldn't say they were like massive teams but they were like there were teams that were backed and it was not necessarily it was there were some weird clauses in mind because it's just like it, it's up to the race director or the team director sure. basically what to put in there and i'm sure ben knows that um but yeah, like I, an NDA is not on anything that I have ever signed, nor would I ever want to. And that's um, one of the reasons we uh, didn't. So we've been talking to writers today and uh, I didn't ask any of the writers to be on because I didn't want to put them in that position of like, even if they wanted to come on, it would probably not be a great idea to have them. So. Right. I mean, they're saying they don't have any money, but I don't I don't know who's necessarily involved. I'm not bound to any contract, though, so I'm not too concerned about what they can do to me. Um, I'll go <laughs> ahead and just throw a big allegedly up over. Yeah, this everything's yeah. allegedly. Um, but yeah, so they received that. And then um, there was also like talking with a bunch of people, not just people directly involved with NCL. Um, there was some speculation on like rider pay and like. Some people were getting paid, some people weren't, some people were getting paid a lot of money, some people were getting paid a little bit of money, and then some people just depending upon, I, I don't know what metric they were really using, um, were just not getting anything. So um, yeah. I know the pay grade dropped substantially from last year. It was supposedly 70,000 for some people, and then it dropped to 30 um, for the highest of what they were, the ceiling, I guess. But um, again, speculation, but that's, that's kind of what I figured. Yeah, I, I figured that. I mean, that's that's sort of standard. Like, uh, especially in American racing, like ten years ago, a team like Kenda or something would have like one or two like ex World Tour guys or guys that you know were World Tour hopefuls that they were paying like a hundred k, and then like five to six guys that they're paying like. 2k stipend and maybe you get to keep your bike at the end of the season mm -hmm. and then there's a couple of people in between there that are kind of like the key domestiques so it sounds like it wasn't even that big of a disparity maybe because there wasn't as much money in general but also maybe because i, I think like the key from this whole thing that that sticks out to me is like the riders are being treated as uh, uh they're not really being valued as like the engine of the thing like the riders are being kind of treated as cattle and not um ultimately they are the ones doing all of the like real work they're the ones training putting themselves at risk physically um not to say that the back end work and getting sponsorships and stuff isn't 
isn't work, but ultimately you can not have a race I mean, without they're the riders. Base. Yeah, they're, they're, the race and everything. they're um, not yeah. the product being sold. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And as of like right now, I have not seen or heard anything from anyone about there's no solid, like tangible plan about because I know there's something somewhere in the announcement, there was something about like assisting with a transfer and helping riders find places there's i haven't seen or heard anything um i talked to several riders today and none of them mentioned anything like that they yeah. all were basically like yeah. either i'm i'm falling back on the team i used to race with whether that's like a local club or something of that nature or maybe i'm gonna see who else is left in the lurch here and we'll try to put together something mid-season one thing that did come up is that the transfer window, so like the timing mm -hmm. of this is so bad. Oh, We've just awful. gotten yeah. through like that early season period of racing and it's it's way too late for teams to be adding. Like everyone's budget is set and also the um, period for uh, the transfer period is is closed, which really only matters for like pro road nats, but that's still another another avenue that like they waited until that door was shut. And and I don't think it was like anyone in NCL was saying, Oh, we'll wait till the worst possible time to make this decision. But it happened they, that way. Well, yeah, that's the problem, how it went down. <laughs> the problem with NCL and the backers of it is they don't, they're not cyclists. They don't understand the things like the transfer season windows and like how that works. It's, and it's so such a, like, yeah. It's you got to be like really in it. And like, there's even some things now that I'm not super bubble racing that I like have to be like, hey, like, I got to figure out what exactly this is because like it changes all the time. But um, right. I can't imagine going in like completely dry. There's like, there's no way to convey the amount of information that I have over my years of racing, like in a brief, I couldn't I couldn't write a single email that would be able to give everybody the information. Um, right. And I know there was also um, speaking of the transfer window, there was um, the window of registration when it comes to riders being able to like have like guest spots on other teams. Um, I know they weren't registered for Speed Week, so that window was closing um, and there was also no set schedule. Um, so yeah. riders had no schedule for their entire season and they had been hounding management for months. And up until now, there was still there was nothing. They had nothing. Yeah, I spoke to some riders at the road race yesterday uh, in Sumatanga. It's like a new post Sunny King, uh, you know, yeah, race yeah. they're putting on to make it worth people's while. Um, and a, a lot of the NCL guys were in my race, and you know, when I was riding next to him, he'd be like, "So, what races are you doing this year?" And nobody had a really clear answer. Like some some people had answers that were like, "I want to do X Y Z," but no one had a like, "This is what the team is doing." And I, I even heard it. some. I heard yesterday from a rider like, yeah, NCL's working on some deal to get things televised. And I had separate other people message me today who are not riders and say that uh, they heard a lot of money was inked on a deal to get the races for this year, the 24 races um, on not just streaming, but like TV, TV. I don't know if that means like NBC and Peacock or whether we're talking... I, mean, I don't even know what real TV is anymore. Feasible for like, yeah. I mean, as much as I love cycling, but like in the U S it's just, it's, it's just not something that's going to attract a huge audience. Um, and I think as much as like disheartening as that is, I think that it's something that people need to kind of acknowledge if we're going to make any progress towards it. Um, I don't yeah. think it has to either. Like things yeah, it doesn't uh, have like what we're doing right now. We're like, just sending this out to Twitch. Like we, we don't need to be on real TV. You know what I'm saying? Like, Oh, I stream everything anyways. Yeah. Same here. Yeah, I, that's right. what I was saying. I don't even know what TV channel it would be on. Cause I don't like, like is speed TV still a channel. Is that it? Like, I think it's on my Roku, but I, right. I, I don't even know what real TV channels are. And I think that's part of, okay. This is one of the like overarching things that I've been thinking about today is there's this desire in cycling to make everything extremely high overhead and like high i mean this is what killed tour of utah this is what killed tour of california it's like we're trying to make it bigger than it has to be and maybe 
I mean, I want it to reach plenty of people and I want people to like it. That's why we do this show is to try and make it a little bit more digestible. But I think there's this conflation of like, it's got to be expensive and it's got to be flashy. That's why, um, I mean, from what I could tell, at least like over the past year, it was something like they were really pushing for kind of the F1 storyline, mm. um, which was, I mean, I love F1, but I mean, you're not going to make bike racing F1. You're just not. Um, also, but, but also, if you ever watch an F1 race, it's actually boring. It's yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. not the most exciting and, thing on the planet. It's right. Just, and so the only reason so much money in it right and the only reason people care about it that aren't directly involved with it is because of drive to survive mm -hmm. yep. and it's so, also not a sustainable uh. business model like the business model mm -hmm. of f1 and i'm i sort of know f1 i'm not like a deep f1 head but the business model is basically that you find some independently wealthy like oil baron or something that like funds right. your team right? right and like that's mm -hmm. like it's on tv but they're not making the money off of the tv rights yeah the like, streaming is not getting you the main income and there's right. like ticket income but the ticket income is not funding like the sport as a whole is like burning money right mm -hmm. it's literally for like oligarchs to play with billions of dollars right yeah that's literally what it is and I guess like seeing that happening and going like, well, why can't my racing be that is like, I don't know, fair maybe, but also it's an extreme, it's like standing at the complete other end of the basketball court and going like, it's maybe possible to hit it from here and just like chunking one, you know, it's like, right. yeah, I guess that's theoretically possible. I'm not sure if it's well, a great plan. What got plan. me was like, they, um, I saw something, it was like, they were charging, I didn't even know this, um, they were charging people like registrations just to come watch that were like 150 250 dollars and it's like yep. if i heard that even my parents paid 150 250 dollars to watch my bike race like i wouldn't even make them pay for a streaming service to watch it yeah. for like six bucks yeah that's that a is... tough it's a really tough sell in in an in a sport where like even those teams are going to be racing at like 20 other races 20 other crits in the year that you can go to for free so ben right. and i were at ncl atlanta which we got press passes we did not pay the 200 hundred dollar thing <laughs> good mm -hmm. um <laughs> they probably but, regret giving us those press passes yeah now. probably i mean i don't know too late i mean who else was there i don't i can't see anything about the crowd being that huge yeah, it was mostly people who who got comped or people who were prospective sponsors. The sense I got from NCL Atlanta, like them having it at the Porsche Center, and then just like the vibe of the whole thing is that they were really courting potential sponsors. The few like random people, it was very like networkingy. Like it felt like a mm -hmm. like a work event, and mm -hmm. people were just coming up and being like, "Oh, who who are you? Who are you with?" Blah blah blah. And I think we were the only like press there because what they're <laughs> cycling you know uh well, no, no other cycling outlets based in the southeast so well also like the press manager they were paying to like handle all the press people just kept like stalking us the whole time like make oh, sure you great. go to this make sure you go to that and we're like <laughs> it's like you could tell like we we're like the only people like on her like dock to make sure that we were on track <laughs> the whole time wow so yeah. well that's yeah. i got the vibe from like i i looked at the what is it the ceo or former ceo whatever the paris guy i looked at his instagram and yep. saw some of the some of the pictures from that and it honestly it looked like like a work conference from what he posted it was just like a bunch of guys in suits standing by the model cars at porsche and i was like there's yeah. no actual racing that that, that it was actually really yeah. hard to follow the racing from the event. Like everyone was over in this little corral. Oh, it's a huge track. <laughs> we we tried to get down. We actually for the women's race were like down on the track, and they had like handlers come get us and tell us like you can't stand this close to the track. You got to get farther away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So it was built to be like a networking event. It was not built to be, um you know the the sports were in the background and it was like everyone who talked to me i guess i never actually got to this point i do this a lot but 
coming back to it, everyone who talked to me was like someone who was maybe investing in the league or thinking about investing in the league. Um, and they were excited to talk to someone who was like covering it. Um, but they were all like rich guys who, who were looking for a, yeah, a they thing all, to invest they don't know. in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, were, they were not cycling people, I'll say that. And they were not really like fans even. That's what strikes me is like, I don't, I could, I couldn't imagine having that much money and then just throwing it at something that I know nothing about, but like, so like Madeline, you know, when you're at like the sideline of like twilight and you have like these like frat dudes, like outside of the bar and yeah, yeah. they're like, what the hell is going on? And you explain it all. Crane and I were doing that to like millionaires at this NCL <laughs> race who had spent uh thousands and thousands of dollars to make this thing happen and they're like what is this what is happening i'm um, like we had to explain it all to them man let's i mean and if you kind of think about it, at least from my perspective um like i mean i'm a little bit different when it comes to interacting with people at bike races um but i always like i loved interacting with like people on the sidelines at twilight like i, oh, mean, I, I got too. shot out the Absolutely. back and everything if i had to talk to somebody that was like a millionaire or something like that's like the last person I want to talk to. Like, that's not just this. I'm sorry. That's just not like my crowd. I'm obviously look at me, but, um, but yeah, like having a prospective investor that you like, you just finish a bike race. You just kind of want to chill out and talk to like, I don't know, people that are having a good time. These guys aren't even watching the race and they're like, Oh yeah, they're also funding everything. So you have to be nice to them. Um, that just puts people all over it uh, for this entire situation. It makes everything even more awkward. I yeah. will say like I had fun and NCL Atlanta actually ended up being a really interesting race um, because the women's race went crazy and there was a break that ate up all the points and the break didn't have any of the big teams in it. And then it made the men's race crazy, but it was a weird vibe. It was a really weird hang. Yeah. It, it gave like hunger games to me Ooh. like you have like these like working class people like doing a thing and then rich people like betting on it basically literally like, that's yeah, how like, it felt like, above the ring with the bowl and see like, what happens yeah like, not even like hypothetically like, literally on a terrace yeah at the they're Porsche like in the track. office with air conditioning and then these people like right. i don't know about i don't know how bike racers are now but like there's points where i didn't have health insurance like it's still yeah, that way same yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like and then these dudes are betting on it it's like what yeah. this is surreal i actually think like no one was betting on it but i i well, they're throwing money at it that's that's what betting, i meant by betting right. on it yeah sure bet betting on it might actually be a sustainable business model <laughs> if they I've just said, made it like dog track rate i mean i've said it on here is. i've said it on yeah. this show we need to start gambling at bike races and people will care oh yeah i remember uh, there was one where we did like a, a pseudo bet amongst our team and that was like even just like with the little crowd that we had that was that was hilarious that was awesome gives you some skin in the game yeah yeah I'm seeing in the chat. So we're live on YouTube and Twitch right now. And there's a lot of chat flying around for the audio listener. You know, this will go up as a podcast later, but people are talking about a lot of models. And I actually, I think we solved the model on our last episode. So I'm going to say all of you just go listen to that, but it's basically there's a regional series. There's like USA crits is Southeast. There needs to be a like California, Arizona series. And then kind of like a Northeast series with like, existing races northeast is like you know manhattan beach or not manhattan beach um harlem skyscraper manhattan beach is yep. in california but you know what i'm saying like take the big races in each in each um scene and usa crits kind of is this this year usa crits and speed week for the southeast have a regional series the top two or three teams qualify from that regional series for like a couple of national level races and that's how you make it sustainable and doable for teams that are on a smaller budget. Anyway, that's the abridged version. Everybody go listen to yeah, that. Yeah, I would just divide it by whatever the collegiate cycling conferences are. Um, I would say they have a pretty good yep. layout for like where the conference maps are. Obviously, I'm partial to the SEC. Um, but yeah. 
that I think is a pretty good framework for where you can divide things. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's such a big country and it's so um, expensive. Um, I guess I want to get into implications of like what this means going forward. We've been kind of talking about like what happened and, and NCL like last year, I'll say I was skeptical it was going to happen at all. They did put on some races and I did enjoy watching them. And I, I've said it on this show before it, gave a lot of riders a good paying gig, I think, that maybe wouldn't have had it otherwise. The thing that we've always been afraid of is exactly what is happening now. And I think we've said that from the beginning on this show is like, our fear is not that uh, this is a bad format of racing that we don't want getting out there or like, because that's that's a criticism I've heard is like, I don't think this points format is cool and I don't want people to watch it or whatever. People to think that's what crit racing is. We were really mostly concerned with it didn't feel sustainable and it didn't seem like something that uh, cycling teams are no, known to fold mid-year. So this exact scenario is is what we were afraid of. And here it is. I actually thought about introing this episode with that Hive song. Hate to say oh. I told you so. <laughs> but you, YouTube would copyright strike that. Oh, and they, they would wouldn't be. Uh, immediately. Yeah. Yeah. They might strike you just for mentioning the name of the song. Actually, Flow Bikes just striked our uh, video about Sunny King from last year, which, like, Flow Bikes owns Sunny King? I, yeah, they, they have do a now. streaming rights over yep. it. Yeah. But, uh, um... Yeah. I was like, going, what is it, what all right, what were we saying going forward? Yeah, like, I think what what really gets me, like, kind of upset, especially because I'm, again, I'm removed pretty decently now, at least from racing. Um, Obviously, I'm still involved in the community. But, like, just watching this happen again with something, and especially something with, like, what was touted to have a huge budget, like, they're cycling teams obviously that have been ran on less and it's like i know people that could have run this very well and i know people that would have like killed to have that opportunity and to see even something like with that level of support just absolutely eat dirt like so quickly yeah. is is really kind of disheartening um and it's it's sad to watch honestly it is yeah i think a lot of people like there are definitely some people gloating and I think we all kind of knew that it was a long shot that this would work or last or whatever. Just moving train wreck. Yeah. But I've, a lot of people are gloating like, Oh, I knew. And that maybe misses the larger point of like, it's still like bad for racing in general. Like, even if you don't, that's kind of the, like the mm-hmm. point of the title of this video on YouTube is like, even if you don't care about the NCL, even if you weren't going to watch these races, this year it's bad for the sport one it's going to be bad for all of the other races that the ncl teams aren't there it's going to make it way less competitive because especially on the women's side the only teams that could really step up to legion and maybe like dna in 2024 were the the women's ncl teams and on the men's side it was kind of you know legion american cycling group and then the ncl men's teams were kind of the top echelon and so now you've cut that in half on both sides mm-hmm. yeah yep. let's see what i did somebody said it really well to me earlier today um but it was like what did they say they so they basically like just ended funding for like a lot of really big top writers that initially right. were going to show up and it's not even necessarily like the team as a whole, but writers as individuals are like out of what I, I'm assuming is a career and their financial stability to mm-hmm. even be yep. able to move forward. Um, yeah. I think it's something I've been thinking about today is how like, it's really ironic that, one of the things that one of the things that um ncl sort of promised was that it was more um equitable or whatever and and it it tried to put the men's and women's racing on the same footing and have co-equal teams um because of that 
they made up a disproportionate amount of the paying teams or like really well-funded teams on the women's side. So now them going away is an even bigger hit to women's racing than it is to men's racing, which like, I don't have a prescription for that. It's just like a sad reality of it. Yeah. It's just how it is. Ugh. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of the top, top, top level talent in women's racing, like Riley McMullen moved to America to race NCL. So I, that's not someone I know personally or have talked to or whatever, but I would imagine that that puts her in a pretty desperate situation. Um, we've had uh, Chloe Hosking on, and Chloe was not in the NCL, but she was on B&B Hotels uh, when they folded, and she talked about, you know, she moved to Europe from Australia, and the team folded right around this time of the year, and then she spent the rest of the year, you know, deciding what to do. And one of the things she did was come to America to race some crits. And the other thing was start a bike brand, but it's tough to figure that out, especially again, coming back to like the timing, this point of the year is like budgets are set. Races are happening. You know, uh, USA crits started yesterday and continues next week. The train is on the track. So like, you can't really, right. (laughs) Yeah, it's too early to move forward, and then it's definitely way too late to move back. Um, exactly. Right. Yeah, you're you're stuck in just rock and hard place. And it's even a negative for. So this is another like tidbit of information that was leaked to me uh, today that that all of the NCL teams they have NCL like I saw it on the we we were the racing branding. with yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's on all their kits and. Uh, we were racing with um, Rainstorm yesterday, and like they all have the little NCL thing uh, on their kits. Everyone who has that on the kit was supposed to be getting, I think the number is 15K, an amount of money that's not insignificant um, for that, for their participation in the NCL and like promoting it or whatever. So it's like the smaller of a team you are, the more that's going to affect you. So I think like rainstorm will probably be okay. And I think this actually probably makes on the men's side rain, like far and away the dominant team this season. Mm -hmm. But for a team like a primal Audi Denver Goldman Sachs ETF S on the women's side, like I would imagine that 15 K is not an insignificant amount of their cash budget. Like they have a lot of sponsorships that are probably free gear and stuff like that. But as far as cash goes, I can't imagine that they're just flush with cash. So yeah, cash is a super hard. Like I would say, at least in my experience with like teams and getting sponsorships, like people are much quicker to donate kind of gear um, and stuff. I mean, because it's like it's a tangible thing. You can market mm-hmm. it, but donating cash is just or donating or funding something is like that's really hard to come by and 15k is definitely not insignificant um but i know everybody at least on these teams from what i've heard is the last payment goes out tomorrow so they were scheduled to receive monthly payments um and they get one final payment they're not getting like the lump sum of what they're owed for the rest of the year yeah yeah Mm -hmm. that's that's really rough and I think even like, so there's all the riders that were going to be on salary that are left in the lurch. And then think about the riders that were on salary last year, moved teams to, to another team that is not an NCL in house. I can think of a couple of people off the top of my head. They moved to other teams that were going to participate in the NCL this year, but they're not on in house NCL teams. And then the funding for that team is getting cut because of the NCL who just fired them last year. Like, I I think these are the kind of things that I'm sure I'm sure the people organizing NCL have some idea that it's going to be painful for people, but I don't think they understand like what that means for your life if you've kind of dedicated it to bike racing. I think if you're looking at that spreadsheet and you you know x out that line item i think you don't realize that like for some people this is their primary source of income and they're putting a lot into it so yep it's really hard yeah 
I mean, I imagine somebody like Clever Martinez, that income is what he's using to feed his kid. Yeah. And now he doesn't have that. So I think Clever, luckily, okay, this is one potential upside maybe. It, it is it is an Olympic year, and there are a lot of track people involved in NCL. So I think yep. Clever, like I don't know for sure that he's going to try to go to the Olympics, but I know he's been doing a ton of track racing. So, I mean, he's so talented that yeah, if yeah. somebody, it would be a mistake if somebody did not pick him up. Um, right. Which, the, like, the the thing about somebody picking him up is it's April. Right. You can't, it, you can't join a domestic March. team after March unless they extend something, like extend a grace period for this unique situation. Right. You know, that's Yeah. I, I wonder if some of the, um, I wonder if they, there won't be some ex- some extension of some of those rules and some some things to a- yeah. account for this, but also I I hope that it allows a couple of the kind of most talented people to maybe like pivot their focus to track and like have some success uh, trying to get in the Olympics. Like people who are maybe split between there's this potential payday for NCL, but I have to do X Y and Z calendar. Um, even if they hadn't been provided that calendar, I'm sure there's some X. Ex- uh, expectation of like you have to commit to doing at least whatever five national races or yeah. 10 races with the team i'm pretty sure they all had to commit to at least all the ncl races um which is that makes sense yeah, yeah. but i don't know about anything else um i would love to see more track people though that'd be great that's the most money i've ever made riding a bike <laughs> racing track <laughs> racing track yeah i think i got yep. there was one race i got uh i think um my check was like a little over $900 from, I, w- I didn't even win the whole thing. I think I got second in like the whole tournament or something. And so it was what was that? $900 check. It was down at uh, the velodrome in Atlanta. It was a, I think it was a spin the district event, which I do have to give kudos to them. I am partial to them, but I do have to give kudos to them. I think they've done a really good job. Um, Cause they do have a lot of like, they do have a lot of high profile investors, but they do a really good job of supporting kind of the local scene and at least the, even the like spectator crowd um, yeah. is very spectator friendly. Yeah, that that event, they're doing like a midweek track week as part of um, Speed mm-hmm. Week. That's coming up again in like two weeks, I think. Um, yeah, all of the, I think Speed Week is actually a really good example of where I think, and I, I'm seeing a lot of debate in the chat about like where is usa racing going and i think you know there's there's no cut and dry answer of like we've put forth our one theory on how to fix it like at a national scale or at least make it a little bit more doable for teams but i think ultimately it needs to become a little bit more grassroots and a little bit more um spectator focused and i think the events that do those things are the ones that are having success i think Sunny King, by all metrics, uh, was it was bigger this year than it was last year. I think in terms of registration, like my field was twice as big. Yeah, um, they had a little bit of a lull. I remember it used to be pretty big when I first did it, and then it kind of dropped out. But um, mm-hmm. they've it's definitely it's gone up. But um, the directors there always do a fantastic job with like events that other people can do. Um, yeah, like not just racing because I know my own parents won't even come to race. They won't come to a road race. They can't see anything yeah yeah no my wife is not coming to a race she's she actually asks me she's like is it a crit or is it a road race and if it's a crit she'll like you know consider it think she'll consider it (laughs) if it's in a a cute town (laughs) is right the events that do like uh sumatonga uh sunny king has a little festival next to it there's food trucks there's a real like community event there and all of the usa crits like spin the district stuff do a good job of that too, of having you, like some sort of auxiliary event for the community that is a part of it. You know who's doing it the best right now? Who? Rock and Road Crit. Oh, in yeah. Noonan, Georgia. Noonan. Mm-hmm. First year race last year. They put it on with their like annual town festival. So everyone was already downtown doing the normal oh, festival that's good stuff. Scheduling. There's like a century with it. There's a 5K, there's a mountain bike race, there's an urban short track race all happening. Plus all of the normal, like there's bands playing. It's like a town festival. There's like carnival rides and stuff. Um, 
And so people are already there. So at Noonan last year, first year race, not national, just like a speed week warm up, Pat. if you will, packed to the gills, people everywhere. Bars were open. It felt like a mini Athens yeah. this yeah. year. Part of USA crits going to be streamed part of speed week. I think it's going to be like even, even bigger. And that's Michael Zinkin doing that, which is awesome. Who's on NGCA elite. Yeah. So oh, shout yeah. out to him. That was an awesome race, but I think it's like, it doesn't have to get, I think doesn't every race. No. Yeah. That's it's like the crit factor is keeping the overhead a little lower than, than a road race, but also they're not, I think that NCL really underestimated how hard it is to put on an event in public space. Um, their original plan was to do five last year, and they did three. And their original plan was for all five to be in the biggest downtowns in in America. And they did one like that in Miami, and then they moved I heard the other Atlanta, two. And I was like, "There's, there's no way." Like yeah. we had one downtown race in like what Grant Park, which personally I hate that course, but like even that <laughs> awful course, like, yeah, logistically is like shutting down that area and i live pretty close to what is like the grant park course now it is i don't even know how they got the permit to shut that area down it's like in town atlanta is not the place for a race and i don't know about where anywhere else is but that's yeah i actually don't even it's not even that i think that it's a bad idea to have it in town i think you can find ways like there was a time that they did one in birmingham uh around the courthouse it there was it i'm talking even before that this was like before i was writing 15 years ago probably they had one hammerfest was great but it got shut shut down kind of partially for the reasons we're talking about partially because there were a million calendars that kept changing and they just could never find the right one to get on but there used to be a race that was um around the courthouse and it was on a sunday which like there's it's just municipal buildings around there so there's a nice park it can go around the park but you know there's some like creative ways you can you can find a spot where either the adjacent businesses want to have an event and it becomes a little easier to shut things down there but i just knew that um ncl based on the the planning they were doing were, were underestimating it and i think i said it on the first couple of episodes that i was very skeptical like of this show, if you go back to the very first ones, I was really skeptical that they were going to be able to do the race in DC. I think Ben, you said there was no way that was happening and it didn't happen. Not so a chance. I think they ended up burning way more money than they thought they were going to have to just throwing money at problems. They went, they logistical. went half a million. They went half a million over budget on Miami alone. That's the that, number. That, that makes I sense. Got. Goodness. Cause they made the promise of like, Oh, it's going to be right on, south beach Ocean or whatever boulevard yeah yeah and i think they threw that out there before they knew what that took yeah well the other factor is like they don't even they have i don't know how much frame of reference they have for any of these communities i'm just seeing it in some of the chat um but like i mean athens costs a ton of money to put up and everybody like everybody in athens knows what twilight weekend is um mm -hmm. and if they don't they're gonna find out because it's uga graduation weekend um and the city is super supportive of it and like yeah. at least everybody that knows and involved in like the government aspect of athens knows what twilight is and always wants it to happen even yeah. then that costs a ton of money so going in with like you don't know the community you don't know anything you're approaching a complete stranger essentially with the proposition to hey can we take up all this space is just like that expectation that you have is so high and unattainable that it's mm -hmm. just, it, it's not even funny. Yeah. That's always going to be a really tough sell, I think, starting out, which is why I, I think another, like, part of the, the prescription, I guess we're getting into the, like, what do we do moving forward piece here. Uh, I think another, like, prescription would be we have a lot of races that are, well-established and successful so i think if you're gonna make a new league or a new thing even if you wanted to go to i don't know snake alley and say like hey we want to do a points race and we're going to do a thing where in all of our races like the ncl format you know there's points yeah. on every lap or whatever and say 
now Snake Alley is that, and every time you get to the top of the hill, you get points. Like, I think starting with an established race that you can build on that has some sort of connection to the community is just going to be a lot easier than, than going in cold. Not that, not that I don't want to see more races, but I think the problem, especially in crit racing in America right now, is not that we don't have enough races. It's that we're trying to like detract from the things that are already successful to some degree or, or pull focus. Well, it's oversaturated. From. Like yeah. there's, there are, I mean, I, I don't, there's a bunch of bike races, but we don't ever hear about them. Cause like people don't have the money like this. Um, yeah. and I think I saw, I think it was Chris Tolley made a good point. He puts on the driveway down in Austin and it does cost a, cost a lot of money, but he made a good point of like, look go to the people that are already experienced with putting on these events and just like partner up with them because like it's already established they know what they're doing you have the money if you pair up like pair those two things up i think like putting on mm -hmm. like some relationship has already been established now it just needs funding yeah i totally agree with that um I also think that's a good, like, bringing up Tolly in the driveway is another piece of the puzzle, I think. This is not as glamorous, and it's not, like, the thing that you're going to see and say, like, oh, road racing is saved or whatever, or crit racing, because that's really what we're talking about here. Um, but I think that series like the driveway, which is, like, a local weeknight series that's not trying to be a national... Like, you get people traveling to it occasionally, but... Mm -hmm. um those series that are more like training races the the places where you can sort of like get stuck in and learn to race and it's a a recurring thing that happens in the same community like those are the things that are going to get people into race and ultimately in america it's going to be a participatory sport so how do we get more people to participate i think is the key and i think having more like approachable local races that are well put on yeah. and you can count on them you can set your watch by them is a really good way to do that and it's not nearly as intimidating like i'm totally. specifically having one that is like an actual race because i know here in um atlanta we have the like we have the TNC. tuesday night crit mm -hmm. yeah and that's really just kind of a mashup of everybody's running together you pay five dollars to, to tip the the guy ben knows mm -hmm. the whole deal yep. um Mm -hmm. but that's results don't get put anywhere so it's like it's a fun race it's good to like learn stuff but then having something that's like a step up like driveway where it is an actual it's it's a race with results and everything but it's not necessarily like the end all be all we don't need like this pinnacle kind of event and it's on a regular schedule i think yep. is something that would definitely get more people kind of interested seeing that's like oh maybe i can do this um, yeah yeah yep. totally i i think we've kind of got this you know in america this culture of you got to be the biggest and baddest all the time and mm -hmm. that's not a lot of folks in the foot trying to do this bike racing thing instead of starting small and growing it they want to start big and stay big and that's just not the answer and that's what rock racing did and you mentioned it last year I, yeah we were talking about ncl you're like and here's the rock racing of it all. Yeah. And that's, this is the rock racing. Of I haven't it all. heard that in forever. <laughs> uh, yeah. I forgot I even said that. I called this the rock racing of leagues, I think. In Seattle, My coach used to make those. jokes about them all the time whenever stuff like this came out. It's, it's nothing new. It's like a new package, but it, it's a familiar story in cycling, unfortunately. And I, I think it is true that like the, the TNCs of the world and the driveways of the world are really the answer to growing participation. People need a non-threatening way they can like get connected and they need something where like I started in cyclocross. So we had a whole local cyclocross series that had, approachable. yeah, yep. it had like 12 races or something at the time. And I went one week and watched it and was like, oh, okay, like I understand what this is now. And then I, found a bike and then I came to, you know, it, it was something I could like find a way into. But if all that exists are sort of like these big 
high budget national races and NCL to get back to NCL didn't have any uh, amateur racing community racing or whatever, which like, I don't know. I had mixed feelings on that. I can see the argument of like, uh, there aren't amateurs racing Flanders before, but that's actually not true. Cause they do a Fondo on the course the day before <laughs> yep. people love to say that and they're just wrong, but yeah, I don't know. I, I think we have to access we have to accept that it's a largely participatory sport and you kind of need to do some amount of bike riding to sort of understand it. Right. Yeah. Well, it's also like at races the participators in the amateur races are the ones watching your professional races on the course. Yeah. Like at least 8 out of 10 of those people, right? And so it's like, yeah, if you want people to go to your bike race, you have to have amateur bike racing because the participants in the amateur races are going to support your professional races. Well, that's how, like, I got started. I had to, like, show up to a race just, like, completely high and dry. I had no information about what was going on. And it's Mm -hmm. like, if I didn't have, like, an amateur race to show up to and be able to watch the pro race. I, I went to Athens when I was, like, in elementary school and i remember being like oh my god these people are insane Mm -hmm. um and then them having the amateur races is like kind of a foot in the door for at least people that are semi-curious to throw themselves around a city block um and not having that makes it just kind of like okay well then why are we here yeah well we said we were gonna keep this one short and we're coming up on the hour uh I feel like we've at least touched on all of the big like points that I wanted to get through. I don't know. Do y'all have anything else you feel like we've totally missed? No. I got anything. Um... I think the, my like overall takeaway is just like, it just sucks. I hate to see the riders going through it, you know? Yeah, I know the company said at the end of, or the company is the language. Um, They wanted to take the opportunity to thank writers for their contribution, which is. Yeah, that's too little too late. Okay, no, here's what I will say. They're talking about coming back in 2025. I, no. Yeah. If you're a bike racer and you sign a contract with the NCL in 2025, you you deserve what's coming with that. Who would do that at this point? Well, I, I would I even well, sympathize with that. It? That they're trying to find some other, you know. Stooges. I heard I heard that part of the reason that this happened is supposedly like a billionaire investor dropped out at the last second, which like I mean, don't count your chickens before they hatch. That's like first right. life lesson. But uh, yep. just if you if they come back in twenty twenty five, there's also going to be like I've already seen a few like less than gentle sentiments expressed towards the people running it and yeah it's not hard mm-hmm. to get run out of town in bike racing i have seen it firsthand nope. yeah i think they've got uh, they they've uh bought a lot of bad will with the like even last year they fired half the rosters in like october or whatever and they they fired almost everybody on denver they kept three people yeah. Yep. And and we talked about that on this show and I was like, look, that sucks and that's kind of like a strike against them, I will say, but if that's what they got to do to right the ship, but this is kind of like a at least that happened after most of the racing. This is putting people yeah. in like the worst possible position. So I feel like they're they're get, going to get a lot of like bad blood, ill will and someone would have to be very desperate now there are a lot of riders that are really desperate to uh to you know sign riders or whatever riders are desperate to sign yeah they burned a lot of bridges yeah that's a good way to say it um so if they do try to come back in 25 and also if there is any money left i feel like the thing they should do if they really wanted to to set things right and you know, figure out their funding for 2025 is say to all the riders, here are the financials. We have this much money in the bank. We cannot make this season happen. We're going to give each of you X percent of the salary you were promised. 
we don't have bikes or whatever, but like you can keep the kit, you can keep the helmets. If you want to go to three races, we'll pay your entry and, and stick with us for this year. And then we'll, we'll come back next year stronger. Mm-hmm. Right. The I, fact- I kind of want to know the plan of like, is like, they said restructuring and pausing and there's all that language in there, but it's, I, who are you, who, with who? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It does make me wonder, like, are the people doing all of that restructuring still getting paid? I don't know. It's just not a great look all the way around. And I think it's going to make it pretty tough for them all the way around. Anyway, well, thanks for coming on, Madeline. It was great to have you. Yeah. Thanks for letting me talk into my camera. Yeah, for sure. And uh, thanks, Madeline. (laughs) <laughs> we didn't we didn't really talk Redlands or uh, Sunny King, but we had actual good racing. So I guess we'll do another episode, uh, a normal episode in the coming weekish. I don't know. We'll get together on scheduling, but possibly. Yeah, yeah. I got uh, nothing on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were there. So uh, actually, we were at Sunny King. So if someone who was at Redlands wants to get at us, please do because we don't. You know, there's only one stream, so. We only know what we could see on Instagram on that one. Anyway, everybody keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, We'll be on YouTube. Subscribe on all the podcast platforms. Thank you guys for watching. See you later.